Well, hello folks. The first thing I want to do today before we get into the video is to thank you, the regular viewer, for watching this show. You know, it wasn't too long ago I did an episode and I had mentioned that I thought about uh, filming the building of this dining room table that I had to do for a client. And so many of you in the comments were so kind and gracious in the way that you asked for it because it made me understand that you realize it takes a lot of time to set up cameras, light, sound, narration, and then to go and edit it. Um, but you all were so very nice, I couldn't say no to you. So I think you're really going to enjoy it because there are tons of really good woodworking lessons in this series. So if you're new to the show, I want to say welcome. And the whole purpose of my show is to teach you woodworking skills to raise your confidence and your abilities so you become a better woodworker. All right, without further ado, let's get into the first part of this dining room build. Now, before we get started, I do want to thank the folks over there at Woodcraft for sponsoring today's episode. Woodcraft has the right tools with the right people to help you get the job done right. Also, I want to thank KenCraft. KenCraft is where I go and buy all my domestic and import woods. And you don't have to live near KenCraft to have that benefit. Just go to their website, order online, and they'll ship it right to your door. Now let me start off by saying I've been a professional woodworker for 23 years now. And this dining room table is not only my favorite piece I've made to date so far, but it's actually my most complicated one. Now, a lot of people are surprised to hear that. In fact, when I posted pictures on Instagram and Facebook, uh, people are like uh, very elegant design, very clean, very simple looking, but it couldn't be anything farther from the truth. There was so many uh, difficult things about this table. Now, one of the things I did to try and prepare for that was I built a scale model of the table as well as a full-size mock-up that I could actually walk around and look at. Now, if you're curious why I do that, I actually have two video links in the description below that explains the benefits of working from a model and in building a full-size uh, scrap wood mock-up piece. Now, even with all that said, with all this preparation, I still couldn't foresee some of the problems that came up. So trust me, in each one of these episodes, I'm going to share with you the problems I ran into and uh, the solutions that some worked and some didn't, but ultimately I was able to work through it. Now I've decided to break this video down into small segments because the actual raw footage of this was like five and a half hours and no one's going to sit through that. But I'm trying to break it down into smaller chunks. Uh, so in this build, we're going to start with the very basics, uh, the wood selection, grain orientation, joining them together and doing some curves. Um, and if you're an experienced woodworker, this might be a little elementary for you, but trust me, you're going to want to stay with the series because we get into some really tricky angles, some interesting jigs, and some problems that I just couldn't have imagined until they happened. All right, so without further ado, let's go back to day one and building this table. This is the material that I'm going to be building the table out of. This is birch, and this is going to be the material for the top. I'm going to make that first. Now, this is six quarter, which is an inch and a half, and I'm going to have a final dimension of an inch and a quarter. I purposely ordered it oversized, so if there's any kind of... Uh, twist or bows or whatever, when I join the boards together, I can flatten it down and I'll have plenty of material there. Now this material is what they call S3S, so it's sanded or smoothed on three sides. So my top, this edge, and the bottom are all flat and square. It's this last edge that I have to take care of and it's typically rough and what you'll see is it's not at an um, even dimension. So I'm about nine inches here. Uh, looks like eight and seven eighths. And then all the way down here, I'm at nine and a quarter. 
So I'm probably going to measure over from this edge uh, eight and three quarters, snap a line, and then I can either rip this on uh, my table saw or I could use my uh, domino, or not domino, my Festool track saw to, to rip it. Either one will do the job for me. Well, it didn't take long into the build, as you can see, that I'm coming into my first problem. As I cut that six quarter down on my saw and then let it sit in my shop a few days, a lot of that wood, it bowed, and it bowed bad. So I had to go with a different design. Originally, I wanted to take like that six quarter wood and glue it together and make like a giant slab, but that wasn't gonna happen because they were out of stock of any more six quarter wood birch. So what I wound up doing was buying some four quarter and I put that in the middle and then like around the outside I used the six quarter that I had that was still good. And so this cost me uh, a little bit of extra money for the material, but that wasn't bad because I had that kind of budgeted in for some mistakes. It cost me a lot of time because by doing that frame I had to go with breadboards, mortise and tenons, draw boring. A lot, a lot of extra time went into that. And I didn't feel I could go to the client and ask them for more money for that because we already agreed upon a price. So um, I just kind of had to bite the bullet and go forward. However, it did end good though because uh, ultimately when the customer got their table, they've lined up two more furniture projects from me. So I guess it's okay. Now I did do a little video uh, showing the forecasting of that tabletop trouble. And if you want to see that more in detail, well again, it's in the description box down below. I took the time to lay out the boards in the green orientation that I think is, is going to match up the best. And then what I did was I went ahead and I labeled them. You can see one, two, three, four. That way when I take these and I'm going to put them on the joiner and um, join the edge, uh, I don't get them flipped around. This way I can match them back up. I don't get them out of order. Now the area where it it's flat and matching pretty good. Well, I'm going to use a, a biscuit. And a biscuit is just a football shaped piece of wood that this tool will cut a slot and the biscuit will go in. And that's just going to help keep the boards aligned. Now, on the areas that are pretty extreme, like here, I'm going to use a domino. And this is from Festool. And what this is going to do is going to cut a longer mortise into the piece of wood and this floating tenon, it's going to go in there and it's going to make it a lot more rigid, a lot more stiff than what the biscuit joint can do. So you can see here that the top is all fit together, but it's not glued up. I just merely did a dry fit. The purpose of this was to make sure that the dominoes and the biscuits all lined up properly. I didn't have any problems there. And I wanted to make sure too that I didn't have any gaps on this. Now, I will admit that pushing these long boards through my joiner on a couple of them, maybe I, I moved it or racked it a little bit. And so I had a gap. And what I wound up doing was on the fence, I just turned it back maybe a, a degree, just very, very minor. That way the top edges of the board here are pinching tight. And if there's a gap at all, it would be on the bottom side where we wouldn't see it. Okay, at this point, it's time for me to glue it up. Now, when I glue up a table of this size, I don't try and do all the boards at once. Uh, I find that the glue either sets up on me a little too fast. If I have any kind of problem or if I have a little gap or something, uh, I usually notice it after the fact and then, well, there's nothing I can do about it. So what I like to do is I'll glue up two boards at a time. That way I can make sure that everything is fitting and adjusted just right. And then I'll slowly 
add the other boards together. So I'm probably looking at four different glue up operations here. So I better get going. If you watched my show for some time, you know I'm a huge fan of using winding sticks and the electric hand plane to flatten large boards or slabs. I find that it's uh, incredibly affordable. You don't have to spend a lot of money on tools. It's very fast, much faster than a router and a sled, and it's incredibly accurate. So if you're interested in how to use winding sticks, I also have a video I did a couple years ago down below. You guys got a lot of videos to watch. At this point, using my winding sticks and the electric hand plane, I got the top of this table flat. Now, it's not smooth. <laughs> That's coming later. Right now, I just wanted to make sure that it's flat. Now I'm gonna flip it over and do the bottom. Now, typically, this wouldn't be important to do because no one's gonna see it, but let me show you why I'm gonna flatten the bottom. So the plan is to make a breadboard with tenons on the end here. Now, if you notice, to get the top flat, that means that some of these boards that were warped or uh, bowed in some way or another uh, the bottom is inconsistent, so you can see I'm thicker here, and I'm pretty thin in this area here. And if I'm going to make a tenon on this, I need the tenons to be all the same thickness. So I'm going to flip this over and show you how I'm going to flatten this all out. So the top is turned upside down, so the bottom is facing up, and now I'm going to use a marking gauge. It doesn't matter if you have a marking gauge like the simple one by Stanley that just has the pin sticking through it, or if you have a real nice one, like I like this one by Wood River uh, that has the wheel on it. What I'm going to do is I'm going to find the thinnest part of the table and I'm going to set my marking gauge to that. Now I'm going to trace around the whole tabletop and then I'm going to take my electric hand plane and I'm going to plane the whole thing down till I hit that line. Then I know this whole thing is the same thickness going all the way across. I simply went through then just with a pencil and uh, made a line inside where I scribed so it's easier for me to see when I want to plane down. Oh man, that looks really good. Maybe just a wee bit more on this side, but for all intents and purposes, this baby's flat. Now I know a lot of people are going, Chad, why do you bother using the electric hand plane? I mean, why not use the router and a sled and everything to flatten this? Well, let me tell you something. This is fast and it's accurate. I did this side in under 20 minutes. I couldn't even get my router set up in that amount of time. Trust me, if you haven't watched my video on how to flatten large slabs with winding sticks, I'll have a link in the description below. But this baby is good to go. Nice. All right, what you're seeing in this part here is 
This is actually some of that six quarter that's going to be part of that frame that goes around it. And I'm going to join that six quarter to the field, the four quarter, uh, by using the, the domino again. However, I'm not going to glue it at this time. I'm just doing a dry fit on it. And also, too, what you're seeing is I made a curved template there to put that arch or curve on the outside edges. This is going to be hard to kind of show you because it's so long, but I wanted to take a moment and show you how I made the template for this curved layout. So I have some quarter inch plywood here and what I did was I ripped a thin strip of it um, off of here. And then I found the center line of it and I marked off every 12 inches from this. So since I did this side, I'm going to show you how I laid it out on here. Now it's real easy to, you've probably all seen this before, I turn this on the side. Uh, I, I have a two inch mark right here on the end. That's where I want the curve to start and I want the curve to come up to the middle. So I'm going to put a spring clamp to hold that in place. I'm going to do the same down here at this end two inches from the edge, put a spring clamp. Now I'm going to, from the middle, pull, pull this thin strip up to the edge and I'll put another spring clamp on it. All right, so that makes a pretty nice curve, but is it accurate? So what I like to do then is at each of these 12 inch marks, I'll measure inch and a quarter and that's off just a little so I can move it and I have some tension on this because the spring clamp is holding it I can move this over a little bit and it will hold its place so measure this one move that in a little and the last one Looks good. Now at all these points, I'm getting the same measurement. And now I can take my pencil, trace the curve, cut it out, and I got a perfect template. Okay, now that's part one of this video on making this dining room table. And below in the description, I'm trying to include the tools that I'm using on these builds because these are tools that I truly like and use every day in my shop. And if you would like to add them to your collection, well, there's links below for that. All right, coming up in part two on this series, we're going to focus on those breadboards. I'm going to show you the proper way to do the tenons, the mortise, take an account for wood movement, use a method of draw boring, which means I can attach it with no nails, no screws, not even any glue. Oh yeah, and I'm also going to show you mistakes along the way during that process. So there's a lot to learn on next episode. And as always, if you have a question about a project you're working on in your shop and would like some help, feel free to write me at woodshopintime at gmail.com because after all, my whole goal is to make you a better woodworker. Thanks so much for watching and until next time, keep on dancing.